everybody. Welcome. It is uh, 5.35, so I think we're going to get started. Uh, welcome to Curry Public Library. I am Jeremy Skinner, and I'm the library director. Um, and before we really launch in and introduce our speaker tonight, I just wanted to let you know it's uh, an outdoor themed uh, programming for the next few weeks at the library. We have uh, in one week on Thursday night, the week from today on May 5th, we're going to have a movie screening and it is the documentary called uh, Meru, the story of three renowned climbers, uh, first ascent of Mount Meru, the most technically complicated peak in the Himalayas. Um, that will be here. And then in two weeks, at same Thursday at 5.30, we're going to have uh, Kelly Timshack from the Lower Rogue River Watershed, and she's going to give us a slideshow and talk about recent projects to improve habitat on the Lower Rogue River estuary. And we have other programs too. If you have not um, been in the library much, uh, we use our space. We have regular programs on Saturdays at 10 uh, in our tech lab. So if you want to learn how to use any of the equipment or software that we have, you can come in on Saturdays. We have regular uh, drop-in times as well for our tech lab throughout the week. Um, we're going to have a big summer reading program this summer, and that's not just for kids. Um, you can track your reading and log your reading hours, and I think there's prizes. <laughs> so, um, so with that said, um, tonight we're thrilled to welcome Gabe Howe, the executive director of the Siskiyou Mountain Club. Gabe began exploring the Siskiyou backwoods in 2005 and moved to the Rogue Valley from Portland in 2008. In 2010, Siskiyou Mountain Club started a small group of volunteers determined to restore a single route through the infamous Kalmyopsis wilderness. Gabe will um, talk about this story and uh, we also tonight have Alex Ralph from the Siskiyou Mountain Club uh, who is a stewardship coordinator here with us. Um, so thank you, um, and let's let's give them both a round of warm welcome. Thanks for having me, and thanks for the nice introduction. Um, very very generous of you. Um, so I have to share with you. This is a little bit like I'm nervous because I haven't done this for two years, <laughs> 25 or 26 months. I want to say so. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. It's great to be back um, having this sort of community engagement in Curry County. I love Curry County. I love it here. I spend a lot of time here and um, just just love visiting and, and being able to, to interact with folks. Um, and to start things off, I, I like to get to know my audience a little bit. How many of you would say you know Siskiyou Mountain Club? Okay. And how many of you have been to one of my talks, or a volunteer party, or a hike, or something like that before? Okay, no, this is good. Okay, okay, this is good. We have we have a lot we have a lot to cover. Um, but yeah, two years ago in February, February 2020 was the bit last big event that I did, and it was in a pub in Grants Pass in a dark banquet hall, and we packed about 120 people into there and we were having beers and we were having a good time and it was a very wonderful, wonderful, super spreading event. <laughs> um, it's one I'll never forget and I'll be the first one to admit that the last couple of years have been tough. They've been tough for everybody. We've been really lucky to have an operation that's outside and we work with a lot of young people and we've steered clear of this thing pretty well but I've just been working really hard to keep things normal for our kids. My kids are in the second and fourth grade, respectively, and I need them to be really fit in a couple of years because they're going to come work for me. And they don't know this, so if you happen to interact with my kids this summer, 
don't tell them, but I've been keeping a spreadsheet for the last 10 years and recording all of the expenses on this ledger. And they don't know it, but when they turn 12, I'm going to put them to work and they're going to start paying down that debt. Um, so we've you know, kept them in the YMCA, kept them swimming, put them back in school as soon as we could. Um, and we've been working hard to keep their lives normal. This is a 501c3 public charity. I have absolutely nothing to personally gain from them working for me other than buttering up my board and getting some more labor going. Um, but that's why we've kept things normal for them. Um, but seriously, it, it has been tough. We all know it. And I'm so sick of hearing about the politics and hearing about COVID. Um, and if there's anything the last couple of years have shown us, it's that, work with me here, forgive me please, it's been a long time, right? Give me a couple years, sad folks here. Um, you know, these places are really, really important. These public lands are really important. From the Grand Canyon to the Redwoods, to the Rogue River, to Hunter Creek, these are really important places for these communities and if there's something else we've learned in the last two years, it's that we can actually lose these places. Um, and I'm going to share more about that. I'm going to share more about the places that we're losing. Um, but first, I want to first take you through a little talk about how Siskiyou Mountain Club got started. You guys been here? Curry County Joe. Um, so we did, we started in 2010, basically a group of friends got together and started running week-long volunteer trips on the east side of the Kalmyopsis Wilderness Area. These people did not get together because they believed in public lands, they didn't even get together because they were that great of friends. They got together because I bribed them with beer and pizza, okay? They would come out for a week, you know, these, this is the original crew right here. Um, They'd work and then they'd come back and I'd throw a party at the Redwoods or at the coast. And this continued on through 2011, 2012. Um, and I was just really hell-bent on completing that project through the Kalmyopsis Wilderness, that 27-mile route. And I would often go out there by myself overnight. That's where I really learned how to do this work. I didn't have anyone looking over my shoulder, which was nice. And I just loved it. I, I loved it. But I could tell that I was never going to be able to finish that on my own. So I kept recruiting college students. Um, I was, you know, 26, 27 this time. I was going back to college. I had all these like 20, 21 year olds in class. And I, I started inviting them on these trips. And it really started to get institutionalized when they started getting school credit for going out there. So we'd go out for a week. We'd come back, beer, pizza, I'd sign off on their paperwork and say, yep, you did your 60, 70 hours, whatever it was. And um, it was a good deal for everyone. They got a bunch of hours um, for their school credit. And despite coming for beer and pizza, some of them stayed because the work um, became meaningful to them. And uh, we kept doing this, but by 2014, which was the year that Ms. Ralph back here was an intern, and you might be able to pick her out of that group there, um, we, we started to build a, a real intern program. I hired a crew leader. Um, we finished that project after four years of working on it. Uh, we started to provide interns a stipend and some educational options through it. Um, and that's really when things kicked into gear. We started to get a little bit of money and, and started moving along. And before I go any further, I want to take the time to describe these trail conditions that we were encountering. Because if you haven't been out there, I know some of you have, um, it's pretty remarkable what happens after these fires and years, sometimes decades of no maintenance. This is a good example. This was the Upper Chetco Trail 1102 right in the heart of Curry County. This was before um, we got to it. You know, these saplings are growing up from after the biscuit fire. Uh, trees fall down and then we go up and, you know, we take these hand saws and everything else and we clean them up. They form, you know, these logs form these big stacks that we call jack straws. Um, they can be as tall as me or if not taller. 
uh, brush starts growing through them and they kind of become these death traps. And so these aren't trail conditions where you got to hop over a few logs every couple miles. These are trail conditions where you can't see the trail, you can't step on the trail because the brush is so thick, um, and you end up in these really complex situations with complex binds and everything like that, and that's what we were up against. And in 2014 is when we really started to put some order into it. Um, and the reason I share that is because this is what this organization was built on. We have grown a lot since then, um, but we still go back and do this over and over and over again. We ran hitches that summer that went on for two, sometimes even three weeks, because that's what it took to be successful. Um, we packed in supplies like Sherpas for our Wilderness Corps. We started, we gave it that name, our Wilderness Conservation Corps. And they spent long days just getting through this route, working on these, some of these very trails that I just showed you, inch by inch, foot by foot, mile by mile. And I'm describing this in such detail because I'm going to go on and describe the growth that the organization has seen since then, but this is really all that we do. Um, you know, we've grown an operation that can mobilize volunteers, interns, staff, get into the backcountry, open up the trails, keep them maintained thereafter, and we love big projects and we love real challenges, and we do it for really big and important reasons, but this is what we do. It's all I've known for 12 years. Trails, backcountry trails. I've lived out this obsession because exploring the Josephine and Curry Wildlands really brought a lot of meaning to my life. Um, and, and I felt the need to give back to it. So between that and hearing me talk for the last few minutes, should not come as a surprise to you that I'm definitely not employable anywhere else <laughs> at this time. It's truly all I know. Uh, but I, I know damn well and it was all born in those early days of learning how to take on these challenges and succeed. It was grit, it's grind, it's hard work. That's all we really know. Um, it's that more than anything else. It's not strategy or brains, it's just hard work. So that same year, 2014, uh, we took on the Pilot Rock Trail over in the Ashland area. We built that trail under our first big agreement, it was for like $40,000, and we were really happy to do it. And we started looking for more projects. So the next year, Alex's crew, after Alex's crew, broke through the county offices. I took that experience, and I identified some trails out in the Wild Road Wilderness. You guys rafted the Wild Road, or hiked the, the Road River Trail. Um, so that winter, uh, we went and we went and scouted these trails. and. It was tough. This Mule Creek Trail, can you guys see this? Kind of, not yeah, I'm gonna get better right now. This is the Mule Creek Trail, you can drive into there. It was full of hundreds of downed trees. The Panther Ridge Trail was in pretty good shape. Everyone, you got the Hanging Rock? Panther Ridge Trail's in good shape, you know, we're out through that. Um, this Clay Hill Trail, we had to totally rebuild. It totally retread that. But you connected those with the Rogue River Trail, and you had this 27-mile loop. So in 2015, we went back there. And now I was just buying pizza, and I was counting on my crew leaders to buy the beer because I was getting too old for that, clearly. <laughs> and um, that year, they opened that route up, and that was a big win for us. That was a big success. That hit the news. It went into magazines. We were really happy about it. And, and this was probably when the Forest Service really stopped rolling their eyes and kind of turned their heads and said, oh yeah, this, they're, they're up to something. Um, that same summer, we worked on a section of the Chetco Divide Trail on the Kalmyopsis Rim Trail. That 27-mile horseshoe that we first opened up in the Kalmyopsis, we connected it, and we ended up with a 52-mile loop. Um, and that's all we've really been doing. We took those formulas from 2014 and 2015, we scaled it, we delivered it to more areas. Over the course of these last 12 years, this landscape between Roseburg and Redding towards the coast from there has been totally transformed. Hundreds of miles of trails that you could not hike or were just about to be unhikable, you know, we have reopened and put them onto a maintenance regime um, to keep them open. 
and uh, it's it's pretty simple. And you know, this work is actually really straightforward. Um, forgive me for my slide issues. Um, hanging rock in the wild road. And uh, I think in a second this map will show up. Um, it's cross-cut saws, it's axes, it's Pulaski's. I'm not an Elon Musk or a Bill Gates, clearly. I'm an underachiever with a lot of support, which is nice. And this is, this is just what we do. It's what we did in the Red Buttes. Um, that's what we did in the Siskiyou Wilderness and the Sky Lakes Wilderness. Um, and that's what we're doing now in the Marble Mountain Wilderness in California this year, which I'll share more with you about. At this point in our evolution, we manage about 400 miles of trails. So, you know, when we adopt a trail and we say, this isn't just one we're gonna open up, but it's one we're gonna adopt, we say we're gonna open it up, we're gonna make this initial investment, and then we'll maintain it at least once every three years. And so that inventory has grown to about 400 miles. Our budget is almost three quarters of a million dollars. Um, I have two permanent field staff, an excellent staff member who does our admin and HR work. Alex is our stewardship coordinator. She manages a lot of moving parts. And then we manage a seasonal workforce of about five returning staff members any given year, and a whole bunch of interns who come on and participate in this program, around 18 this year. Um, so for about four months of the year, this blended crew that we call our Wilderness Corps uh, is busy working eight day long hitches um, with four days off in between. They come in often very green with little or sometimes no even camping experience. Um, but we help them kind of build the skills out and, and get them what they need to succeed in this environment. They learn a lot. Um, they learn a lot about themselves and they also earn a little bit of money and, and some return into staff positions, which are, are pretty good seasonal jobs. Um, we have an attrition rate, you know, about a quarter of people who sign up for our internship make it, you know, less than halfway. And um, I could get into the minutia of that and how things have changed just since I've been doing this with our culture and stuff. But at the end of the day, it's a rigorous program and uh, it isn't for a lot of people. Um, so like I said, some of those interns come back. A few of those return over and over, like through the course of their college career, and those are the people who I promote into my permanent staff. Um, and you know, Alex is a really good example. She's been through the program, she was an intern, she came back as a crew leader in 2016, she went off to do arbory work and work for the Appalachian Mountain Club and do a bunch of traveling, and now she's back. And so, you know, in a nutshell, um, that is kind of what Siskiyou Mountain Club does. Um, sorry about my slides, it's back to the city, not very good. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's what we do. I love this work. It, it's a real privilege to be able to do it. My wife has been very supportive. In the early days, it wasn't always very easy at all with two small children trying to build this and trying to fundraise and everything else. Um, and, and it's, it's just been a, a really wonderful 12 years for me. And now I do have some hikes I want to share with you. I've got an easy hike, I've got a moderate hike, and I've got a tough backpack. So, who's been to Panther Ridge? So, third, third event. So we need to do a group hike to Panther Ridge, and you're in luck because we're going out there in a week for a volunteer trip, which you should all sign up for. <laughs> uh, but since so many of you haven't been to Panther Ridge, I really think you ought to go. And the way you go is you pick up a road atlas, or if you can find a Rogue River Siskiyou National Forest road map, you go up Agnes, and you get to Agnes Pass, and then you just kind of keep going east. It's a long drive, it's well worth it. Um, but, you know, uh, you, you get up there and it is absolutely stunning. This is an easy hike. The Panther Ridge Trail itself is this right here. And it's about eight miles from one trailhead to the other. 
but you could do it in any section you wanted to. You could go out and hike a mile. I did that with my grandfather a couple years ago. He's like 88 now, so he was 86 then. Um, and he had a wonderful time. He had a wonderful time. You get out there, and this forest that you're in is just absolutely stunning. There are Volkswagen Beetles as big, excuse me, Douglas Spurs as big as Volkswagen <laughs> Beetles. <laughs> Um, and you have Hanging Rock, which is this magnificent outcrop that kind of looms over the wild road wilderness. Um, and there's tough sections, there's easy sections, there's three trailheads. Um, and if you happen to catch the rhododendron bush, which I think I've never actually caught it. Last year I went around Memorial Day and that was too early. I'm thinking mid to late June, it would be absolutely phenomenal to catch that because it is just a blanket of rhododendrons. Um, and just the forest up there is, is really outstanding. Um, <laughs> a quick story, my grandfather, who used to be a home builder, you know, we were up there hiking along and he looked over and he said, you mean to tell me all these trees are just locked up? You know, it'd be really good. That's why I quit building houses, because the grain of the lumber just got too thick. You mean I can't, you know, so that was an interesting generational difference in, in, in ours. Um, but even he, having grown up in Oregon over all these years, he could see that the forest was really something else. Um, so, a really cool, you know, you could go up there, spend a night while you're up there. There's a lot of just good kind of dispersed camping. Um, if you want to just go for a day hike, that would be great. I would say from Gold Beach, how long does it take to get to Agnes? About an hour? You know, you're looking about another hour and a half to get up there. Um, outstanding views. And it's, it's, it's one of those places where everything just gets real quiet. Um, so that's an option for anybody. I'm looking at this room. I would take any of you up there. <laughs> the next one I take, I take most of you. Because um, this next one I'm going to point out to you, this is the wild rope loop that I was talking about. Okay, so you, you drive into Tucker Flat Campground, which is kind of down there, right here. That's a great place to start from. And you hike about seven miles up this Mule Creek Trail, which is chock full of history. Um, if you're able to find a copy of the book Illahi and read that along the way, it's really cool because you can kind of trace um, a lot of the history and, and, and see what's going on there. There are these old artifacts, old flumes, old mine adits, um, and bringing that book for me along this hike, it really just brings everything alive and, and is really special. Um, so you get up there. And then you hike along that Panther Ridge, you take this little side hike over to Hanging Rock. Um, you keep going along Panther Ridge, pretty kind of just strolling along, easy does it. And then this trail right here, the Clay Hill Trail, it just kind of nosedives down to the Rogue River. It, it descends at a, a very steep pitch, um, but again, really just something else. Again, the history there is really fascinating, especially when you get into the pre-European history. You can kind of see what was going on there before we started, you know, well, before we stopped fires and that you can see the way the conifers have encroached the meadows um, and, and really get a feeling for that management that was going on before that isn't now. And right here, about a mile above the river, there's this big meadow that was a dwelling of the indigenous people who were there before Europeans um, and later became a homestead. And it's just really something else, especially if you catch in the spring and everything's green. Um, you know, it's probably about 100 acres um, and just really something special there. If you catch it later, you might be able to pick an uh, heirloom apple out of the orchard because the orchard is still there. The little ramshackle cabin is still there falling apart. And that brings you to the Rogue River Trail. And then you can hike back, back to where you came. 
and a really cool section of the Rogue River Trail. It, it, it checks a lot of the boxes. You see Blossom Bar, um, you see Mule Creek Canyon, you see this place called Huggins Canyon where the Civilian Conservation Corps blasted out the trail. Um, and a, a really cool section of the Rogue River Trail itself. There's no shuttle, there's no permit. You just go park and, and hike the thing. And uh, if you're interested in that, after you're done here, we've got the map back here for you. Um, and you can take that on. So that's my moderate hike. That's the, that's the moderate one. Any, anyone feeling that? Anyone kind of want to go do it? Yeah. A little bit? Looking for something harder? Longer? Tougher? Good. Great. Happy to hear. Um, I'm going to tell you to hike across the Kalmyopsis Wilderness. Who's been in the Kalmyopsis Wilderness area? Vulcan Lake, Illinois River Trail, these sorts of places. It makes up a big little chunk of Curry County. Um, a, a really, really fascinating place to visit. Um, one of the original wilderness areas in the 1964 Wilderness Act. It's 180,000 acres. When I was growing up and I was 20, 21 years old, I was I, I got really into maps for one. I don't know why, just one reason or another. I got really into maps. I was looking at Oregon, and I said, I want to go here because it's such a big chunk of wild country that's kind of west of I-5. Mm -hmm. I'd grown up hiking through the Cascades. I'd seen the Mount Jefferson Park wilderness. I'd seen Mount Hood. I'd seen Three Sisters. I'd done some backpacking up in Washington. And I was kind of getting bored. I was kind of getting bored with it because it was, you know, a lot of redundancy. And it was starting to have a lot of people by the time I stopped hiking there too. So in 2006, my wife, we weren't married yet, um, I said, let's go, let's go check this out for the summer. And we started hiking to the County Office Wilderness. You guys all know the Chetco River, but I'd seen the Chetco in Brookings, and I could see it going up in this wilderness, and I could see that it was pretty big up there. And I said, well, let's go up there. Let's check it out. And um, we couldn't get in because of the trail conditions. You know, we, we hiked in. We couldn't get anywhere. We hiked out. Tried a different way in. Didn't work. Another, you know, disaster. Um, she was kind of like, yeah, I'm just... I'm done with that. And um, in 2008, we came in. You guys can't see this. You guys are fine. You can't see it all. So right here is the Babyfoot Lake Trailhead, really special place. And we were trying to go this way. We were trying to come in over here from the Tin Cup Trailhead. It wasn't happening. And so I said, well, let's try this way in. And the trail was really bad. It was really, there was hundreds and hundreds of trees down, but there wasn't tens of thousands of trees down. And um, so we got in, and it was like, yeah, this was worth it because the Chetco River up there was just amazing. It was spring 2008, the Kalmyopsis lichiana was in bloom, and finally we made it, and that was a big win. And we said, well, let's think about working on this route. And literally, I didn't mean to tell this story, but on the way out, we were on a trail, and we started pitching, you know, logs that we could manage and branches and we just started pitching that stuff off this it's an old roadbed and we did it for about 45 minutes maybe an hour and we looked back and we said eh, you know seems like we, we could do this you know and that's literally what started this project is, is then we got out and we said well we, we we've seen a little bit over here we're not very far and the next summer we saw this and we we're like that's bad and uh, we said, well, we're just going to open this thing up. We're just going to do this. And that's when we start bringing volunteers in and doing beer and pizza thing. And, and so I'm going to send you on that route. I'm going to send you on that route. And you guys want to end on this side of the mountain so you don't have a big drive afterwards. So you're going to drive all the way over to Cape Junction. You're going to have your good friend to you, a good friend, not a bad one. They won't, they won't do right by you. They'll be mad at you by the time you get up to the Babyfoot Lake Trailhead. Um, 4,000 feet right now. It's probably still snowed in. 
Um, you're going to want to go in the spring when it's cool. You're going to want to go in the fall when it's cool. Hopefully it's not smoky. You don't want to go in the summer. Just, I mean, unless you like hiking at night. <laughs> you guys laugh. But. Um, and you are going to, you're going to traverse this route along the Emily Cabin Trail. You're going to come to this saddle. You're going to ignore all this stuff down here because you don't, you don't want in that country. And you're going to nose that down to the Chetco River here at Carter Creek. Where we named my son after, um, for no no good reasons. Uh, and then you're gonna hike along the Chetco River here, where Alex's crew was working in 2014. And uh, this section right here, I just want to share this with you. Between here, these six or seven miles of trail that my laser is going through. That constituted about 70% of the work that we had to do on this thing just to get it open. Because the trees fall, you cut them out, out and more fall, and you go cut them out, and it was just, it was crazy. I mean, they were working in conditions where they'd move less than a half mile a day or something. And then what you're going to do is you're going to climb out of the Chetco and down to this little creek called Box Canyon Creek. And then you're going to keep climbing, and you're going to keep climbing, and you're going to keep climbing. And you're going to keep climbing, and you're going to continue to climb more and more and more and more until you get to this ridge. And I want you to know about this ridge, because if you don't want to do this, if you don't want to hike from Babyfoot Lake to Vulcan Lake on the trail I'm describing, just go to Vulcan Lake and hike out this ridge. And that's a, I, I, take, I take anyone here on that ridge, um, because it is spectacular. You have panoramic views. You can see all the way to the ocean sometimes if it's clear enough. You can see the surf coming up. The other way, you can see you know, the high siskiyous. On a really clear day, you can see Mount, see Mount Thielsen and Diamond Peak and more of the Cascades. Outstanding views. And if you catch it at the right time, typically around Memorial Day, the bloom of the Calameopsis lechiana is outstanding. There's huge, huge blooms of it out there. Um, and you're going to hike that ridge back along this dry view here where if you want to see that Lake Chiana, it's like a really good spot to see it. Um, and you're going to end at Vulcan Lake. And that good friend who yeah. dropped you off, they're going to pick you up. <laughs> and who's been on the road to Vulcan Lake? Well, they're not going to be your good friend. <laughs> Um, so, so, and if you really, if you really, really want to extend your misery, excuse me, then what you're going to do is you're actually going to loop, you guys can't see it at all, pointless, um, you're going to loop back along this Chetco Divide Trail, you're going to clear about 52 miles through the course of that, and then you're not going to like me at all because you're going to, He's sitting in a wild news chase. Um, so a really intrepid backpacking trip for people who like that sort of thing. Really, really awesome. Total solitude out there. You could go hike on Memorial Day weekend. You're going to see like two or three people. And you're going to see my crew because we maintain it every Memorial Day weekend to this day. So that's the hike across the county offices. Um, now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the project in the Marble Mountain Wilderness. Ring a bell to anybody? Yeah. A little bit. South, across that, that border. <laughs> I keep trying to move the borders a little bit south so we could have the Siskiyou Wilderness, we could have the Marble Mountain Wilderness, you know, but it was really cool, um, actually, because this was the first time that we really entered into a private-public type of partnership, where there was someone who was really, really interested in just any work at all getting done in the Marble Mountain Wilderness, specifically in the Six Rivers National Forest portion of it. Very specific, right? And for years, he's like, you got to do this, you got to do this. I'm like, it just doesn't fit within our strategy right now and we really want you to like be a 
big donor, but they weren't, I'm not doing it, you know? <laughs> but time went on, and, and I got to know him better, and, um, and then we started, you know, we kind of saturated some of our, our footprint, because we like these big, challenging projects. We like those big jack straws. That's what you send the young people on to learn. You know, after they get through that, then they get to go back and do the maintenance and, and frolic and that sort of stuff. But we like these big projects and we're kind of running out of them in, in the Rogue River Siski National Forest, especially because we've done a good enough job that the stuff we put the initial investment in and we can go in and, and maintain it on a more normal um, regime. And so we started looking like, well, where's the next spot? And we said, well, there is this Marble Mountain Wilderness area, and it has a ton of trails, like hundreds and hundreds of miles. I can't tell you off the top of my head right now. And they're all in really bad shape because they've been burned over, and then they've been burned over again, and then again, and then again. They've been through lots and lots of fires. Nobody's been working on them. And so we said, well, that's, that's the spot. And we said, well, where are we going to find the money for this? And I said, well, I, I, I do know this guy. And... Um, so I started to work with, with this donor more, and, and he made quite a commitment, um, $80,000 over two years. That's a lot to me. Um, and I went to the Forest Service and I said, well, I, I, I have some resources for this. What do you think about matching it? And, you know, through a lot of teeth pulling and fist fights and, you know, everything else, they kind of came around and said, yeah, we, we can make this happen. And so, lo and behold, you know, just last week, Alex was up there working in the Marble Mountain Wilderness, and we've got another one of these cool projects. I, I really apologize for these maps, because um, I know you can't see them very well. But you guys, this is just exactly, it's just going back to that same thing we do. Nothing's changed, you know, other than you have more resources, you have more interest, you, there's kind of, you build momentum because people re-engage with these places and they want to continue to help. Um, but we're just going in there, and like last week, they were just working like in this area where there's a bunch of jack straw, a bunch of down tan oak, just like in 2014 over in the Calmeopsis, and they're out there with hand saws, and we're going to go up there with our crew this year. This is probably a two, three, maybe a four-year project. I don't know because I haven't seen it all. Um, we haven't seen it all, and, and lots of it burned <coughs> last year in the McCash fire. That's where you get. That's where the Forest Service finds money is after fires. Just let you know. Um, and it's like this lollipop loop where you come up here, beautiful, beautiful creek here, and then you take a, uh, I almost said subsidiary, a tributary <laughs> of that, yeah. of that. Bridge Creek, and you go up here to the Yukonom Divide. This is what divides the Klamath and Trinity watersheds, this ridge right here. You're on a ridge, you walk around, and then you come back down the Woolly Creek Trail, back to home in Soames Bar, California. Um, and so that's, that's like the cool new project. I don't have anything more to report other than we've got to get this thing done. Um, How many miles is it? About 60. When you going in, lollipop, out. So, you know, 60 miles. So, a cool route. Uh, cows up here, maybe? No cows down here. Um, traverses. That's something that we're able to do more easily than some agencies and stuff is, you know, I don't, my mission doesn't say you can only maintain trails in the Gasky Ranger District. My mission says I need to maintain trails in the backcountry, and so those divisions between districts, between forests, between the regions, those don't mean anything to us. I mean, they matter because we've got to ask the right people for resources and funds, but we can integrate these projects in a way the Forest Service can't just say, well, the Happy Camp crew is going to go do this, and they're going to traverse, no, no, as soon as, the, you know, no, 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 a lot of no. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And, I'm excited about this project because um, it, it's really great just to kind of be expanding a, a little bit, but it feels like we haven't bitten off more than we can chew. Um, so now I'm just going to take you through. Is that the 299? 96. 96. 96. 
Yep. So now I'm just going to take you through some slides. This is the stuff we do. And uh, yeah, there's some big sugar pines they took out that summer. Great crew. This is from 2014. Alex's crew. I was hiking them in supplies, and I like hiked in without, you know, I was like, I just got to get them bagels. It was bagels, salami, and Parmesan cheese. Like that was the staple, right? I just loaded my pack up and was like, I, 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 I got to hike out now. And they're like, don't hike out. Just stay the night. And so I, I slept easily. Um, Checko River, 2014 intern. Kate McCready, she's working for the Forest Service now. She's doing very well. This is Box Canyon Creek, just last summer, um, last Memorial Day. Um, the County Ops is, it, it, it's a hellscape. I mean, it's burned over, it's a brush field now, but the streams just continue to be really worth it. This is that 2014 crew. Um, you can see the, the gender balance. That was an interesting year, but we're seeing that again this year. I think the guys are playing video games. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I don't, I try to hire. Um, Micah, this guy, he was, you can tell he was happy to be in. <laughs> Rogue River Siski National Forest employee Nate Chobos. Every Memorial Day, he's going out there. County Office League, Gianna, that's my wife. It's in the frame there. That's, that's right out of that Johnson View trip. So you go to Volta Lake and you hike south, you'll, you'll find this. More Leachiana. You guys like flowers? They're really pretty. Uh, this, is, this is what I was, I took this picture in 2008. This is a trail. This is a trail. This is, I mean, you can't see it, but th this is the Bayfoot Lake Rim Trail 1126. That's what we were working, right? Now that's reburned. Uh, pitcher plants, love these. They make the place really magical. You know, they, they really do something for all of us. Wild Road Loop taking a break at Mule Creek. Good friend of mine, Seth. That's, uh, what, that's from that trip that I was telling you, where we finally made it down to the Chetco before we had kids or anything like that. <laughs> that's when we were still happy. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Stone's site. Anyone heard Matt Stone? This is as high up on the Chetco River that you can get on a trail. And we restored it last year. Really cool story from there. If you ever want to look into it, look for Madstone. Paul Faddick wrote a book about his two uncles who took refuge there during World War I. They were uh, dodging the draft out there. No one ever found them. Well, they, they came back. <laughs> Another big log. So you guys, you know, people go, oh, you're up cross-cut saws, huh? You know, they kind of lift their nose at us and stuff. But we get stuff done with these things. They're antiques. They're all forged before World War II. They're sharpened by a master filer up in Roseburg who's got arthritis in a bad shoulder now. We probably got to figure out what we're going to do about that. Um, but this is our discipline. This is what we learned how to do. We learned how to do it well. And, and we take a lot of pride in it when people say, well, can you just bring chainsaws? Like, no, we built an operation around doing this. You're not, you know, no, no, no. Vulcan Lake, love it, love Vulcan Lake, my kids love it. Alex, in 2016, she was coming up from that Taggart Bar, the Chetco, uh, Upper Chetco Trail. We had just finished like a, a brutal climb and uh, tough kids. Lucy Sanchez, she was, uh, was on the Illinois River Trail. It's really fun. It's one of the most gratifying things about this work is I get to bring people out who otherwise would never, Lucy would have never visited the county offices. But she signed up for a trip and I got her out there and she never talked to me again. <laughs> <laughs> That's a young me in 2008 going to the little Chetco River. Uh, post biscuits, so you know this, I mean it was growing as high as the ceiling. Trunks are this big. Um, I used to be up for that stuff, I'm not as much anymore. This is a cool picture. This is a cool picture. So in 2000, well, when was it? 2017, um, for an exercise with my interns, I took them on a hike and we left the Babyfoot Lake Trailhead on that same hike I described to you about 8 p.m. And we got to this summit near Bailey Mountain at about 12.30 a.m. And uh, one of my interns, who later became a staff member and just moved on, um, 
He took this shot of the Chetco bar fight from up there. Um, and I'll, I'll always kind of remember this because I remember being up there and watching that fire from right there and feeling that wind coming up from the Illinois Valley, coming down the ridge, and um, it was really something else. And they, I, I felt really safe, um, but uh, we, we hiked, right? There was no closure. We don't go anywhere the public wants to go, but we hiked right to the fire. We were right across the river from it. And then, you know, several weeks later, we all know what happened. So this is when the fire was, you know, seemed kind of benign and like it wasn't going to go anywhere, but it did. More big logs. It, 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 you got to be able to lift the log. You got to be able to lift the saw up. You, have, you need the strength to be able to move it, but it's the weight of the saw that does the work. That's why you see, you know, it's not all these big tough dudes doing it. And anyone can really do it. It's really more cerebral than it is anything else. Figuring out where you're going to cut it, how you're going to cut it, so you don't end up getting your, your saw stuck and, and running the bad line and stuff like that. Um, so I'm going to leave it on that one. Um, so th th those are my slides. Um, those are my slides. And, you know, I, I did write in the, in the description that I would share some lessons that I've learned. There's been many of them. I've learned a lot about trails, and they are their own discipline. It takes at least a few years to get really good at working on trails, master those techniques. I've learned a lot about motivating people and managing small teams. Um, but the biggest lesson I've learned is how our public lands are managed and understanding how decisions are made and then get carried out, which has a lot of implications beyond our mission, beyond these trails. Um, you know, 12 years ago, this kind of late blooming college student decided that I was going to mobilize people to go in these areas and, and do the hard work that it takes to keep them alive. And, you know, thankfully, I had enough wisdom to surround myself by really great people and we've done a good job. But the backcountry trails that would have disappeared, uh, they're not going to now. You know, these places that I've just described to you, they're not endowed yet, but they, I think they will be. Um, and, and we've done a pretty good job. And when all this started, I, I kind of figured that the agencies would continue to place a lot of priority on popular trails, I assume these popular assets are campgrounds, our picnic areas, our waysides, um, our guard stations, our fire lookouts. I, I, I kind of said these places are going to be okay and that they're not going to rot from neglect and, and disrepair because they're so important because so many people go there. These places, no one's going there anymore. You know, they, the, the local ranger station wasn't getting a call because people had decided that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to try this again. And I kind of got tunnel vision in that, you know, and I didn't realize that the rot, it was happening everywhere. And uh, about two years ago, uh, around when COVID started, a little bit before that, I, I, the gears started turning, and I, it became very apparent that those front country assets that I'm, I'm just calling them, those campgrounds, those facilities, those front country trails that are so popular, um, that, you know, they were going to fall apart, and now that is happening. Um, you know, the Rogue River Siski National Forest just had to cancel 14,000 reservations in Jackson County for their campgrounds because they can't open them. Okay? In Curry County, you've already lost a handful of campgrounds up the Winchuck. These remote campgrounds up on, you know, um, Eden Valley, you know, hazard trees that they can't get down, this sort of thing. This is happening. And I want you to know that I work with really, really great people in the Forest Service. We're funded by them. They, they put up for about a third of that budget. Um, I work with exceptionally committed people, and they're swimming upstream right now. Uh, they're a strong partner. 
This isn't a critique, it's an observation, and, and that's all I can share. And you can really pain yourself by getting the details, and I've done that. They're important, and it's my job to understand those, but at the end of the day, these places will continue to appear if decision makers aren't hearing from you. Um, if, if they're not hearing from the public. Your commissioners, your legislators, your district rangers, your forest supervisors and regional foresters, they need to know from you, from the communities, not from the, the wild office in Portland, okay? They need to know it from you that, you know, keeping ranger stations shuttered isn't okay. <coughs> uh, letting campgrounds close, it's, it's, it's not all right. This isn't a complaint to the staff that you want to make at the front desk or who you see out cleaning the bathrooms or you see who cruising the roads. It needs to go, and, and be nice to them, by the way. They're, they're, they're your allies and they want you. That person at the ground who doesn't have enough resources to hire someone to help them clean the, the, the bathrooms, they, they want you to call. Um, the decision makers have to hear from people and in my experience, what I've learned in these 12 years is that does work. Your voice matters. And when decision makers hear congruency and alignment in the messaging, stuff happens. And that's the only time you really see anything happen. And, you know, the, the reason why, you know, I, I'm not pulling some alarm bell here. I'm not an alarmist. I'm pretty pragmatic. I'm pretty moderate in just about everything I do. It's not political. It's the truth. If the communities don't get together, and let the decision makers know that they want to keep these places, you want to keep your campgrounds, you want to keep your trails, you want to keep your picnic areas, they're, they're going to be lost. And the reason why, the real reason why is because it's legal. The Forest Service can't go close a road without going through a review process, an EA, public comment, protest, court, blah, blah, blah. Inaction is not a management decision. Letting things fall apart doesn't take an EA or a NEPA. Letting things fall apart is legal. Abandonment of public assets is legal. Apathy is legal. And that's why these places, that's the real reason why they'll be let to disappear. Because it's legal and there's no one stopping it. There's hope. There is hope, and if an older student at some glorified community college, which is SOU, my alma mater, can bribe kids with beer and pizza to make a difference, then the communities can get together and make sure these places don't disappear. And I go back to the idea that there's nothing special about what it is that we do. This is not computer chips, it is not rockets, it just takes grit, hard work, commitment, organization, a few people can make a real difference, and this mission, I think, is really proof of that. And I don't know where that leads me personally, you know, or professionally, as time marches here. You can probably tell that I kind of have, like, some issues with what's happening, and I really want to do something about it. I can't do that much about it, because the agencies help me, and I kind of need to anyway. Um, but yeah, that's... that's kind of what I've got in a nutshell. Steve DeSico, give this guy a round of applause. He's keeping your part going. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what I've got. And I, I just want to thank you all for coming tonight. This was awesome being in front of people again. I'm sure that you could tell I'm a bit rusty, <laughs> but that's okay. I'm getting back into the groove of things. Um, I want to thank the Forest Service, I want to thank the 1,800 members who support our work and keep everything going, the volunteers, Ms. Ralph, thank you, um, and uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate it. And if you do tonight want to sign up, if you want to get involved with the membership or sign up for a volunteer trip, that's one thing I forgot, a volunteer trip, next weekend is your chance, Friday, May 6th, you're going to show up on Panther Ridge, Alex is going to be there, and you're going to clip a bunch of brush for about a mile and a half, two miles, up to Hanging Rock, you're going to spend two nights up there car camping, you don't have to backpack in, 
You have to backpack in. You just got to bring some stuff overnight. We got water for you. We got, a, uh, you know, there's no toilet, so we have a bathroom kit for you. That's a shovel, some hand sanitizer, and some TV. <laughs> Um, that's, that, that's the way we're rolling up there. But honestly, it is going to be a great time. You have the chance to go see Panther Ridge, learn how to clip brush. Pretty moderate as far as like the work pace and the workload up there. Um, and, and would be amazing. And we have all sorts of stuff on our calendar. And we went two years without having anything real on our calendar. But it's, it's coming back. So I do encourage you to check out our website. There's a calendar on there. I don't know how these things work. And, um, and that would be great. And if you want to get more involved, if you want to become a member, it's 25 bucks. If you want some maps, if you want to sign up for a trip, Alex can get you covered back there. Um, and again, thank you all for coming. I appreciate you being here. Get out there. Enjoy the backwoods this summer. Along thank with you the backcountry trails. We have time for questions. If you guys have questions, Mr. Gross. Well, I don't have any questions. I, I thought you were probably going to read some of the stories, some of the some of the people that did the work. I was just I lived for that. Every every email that was sent out after a weekend. I, I can remember this this one girl that wrote, and it was just absolutely outrageous how she could write well and describe what it was like camping out there and doing this work. You know. Sawing off a log with a with a with the uh, crosscut saw. Absolutely. So, so those yeah. kids have a story to tell. That's just unbelievable. You know, with them standing there, I didn't look like too much. I was just sitting here, but but to saw off a four foot log and like that and safely do it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Maybe and anybody who's worked in the woods would scare them half to death. Yep. And it, it costs nothing to sign up for our email newsletter list. And it is interesting. We send out, you know, real interest stories. And we do. We have interns and staff who publish through our blog and things like that. And, you know, it's it's a lot of fun. And, yeah, some of them are really good. Um, mine? <laughs> Dude. So what's the status on the Illinois <laughs> from uh, the west side? Getting up the ball now. <laughs> well, um, you're you're good to you're good to Connor's place, and then you're gonna you're still gonna see those couple of landslides in the Silver Creek area. But I mean, I, I, I think it's pretty darn manageable. I will just share that like people complain about the trail at Bald Mountain because it is faint, it goes through a meadow. There's probably some braiding, but I'm not doing anything. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Do you need a four-wheel drive to get to Panther Ridge? I'm not familiar with this. Nah. Now I've seen like Priuses up there. <laughs> I'd probably go in really slow. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, it's a pretty darn good road. Okay. It's easy to find. Yeah, if you, you know, I, I don't know what people, people use the Avenza, they use all these things anymore. I just, I, I use the transportation map from the, from the forest office, go bang on the window or something, and I'm sure someone will come out. You've always, you've always needed our uh, location. Yeah, no, if, if, if you reach out to it, so we operate from Gold Hill, Oregon. Yeah, you'd be coming from Fort Orford, so, you know, but we, if, if you reach out to us, we coordinate with you to make sure that if you don't show up, we call your emergency contact. Well, <laughs> yeah, that, that's a start. <laughs> any other, uh, any other questions or? Thank you, Curry Library.